The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Top Solid 2020 webinar with a key focus on the 2D milling improvements for version 7.14 or the 2020 version of Top Solid 7. Um, hope everyone's having a great day. Happy Friday. Uh, we'll give it just uh, maybe 20 more seconds for people to continue to log in here and then we'll get fired up. Um, we have a lot of things to go over today. Um, I believe, let's see, perfect. Um, if you look up here or over to the right here in my project, you see my milling 2D folder here and you can see uh, there's 31 actual points that we're going to try to hit on. And I'm going to do my best to get through as many of them as I can, as quick as I can. Uh, the only one I'm not going to touch on today is point number one. Uh, this is brand new in Top Solid uh, this year. This is uh, machining features is what MF stands for. Um, we are working to tie more information from Top Solid Designs into manufacturing. Uh, it's a big topic, so I think I'm going to schedule a webinar in the future just to go over what machining features are, what they can do. I want to put together some good samples for everybody. So with that said, let's start with the next point. Uh, some of you may actually uh, be aware of this uh, and are excitingly or uh, have been excited to hear about it, but uh, I'm pleased to announce that boost milling is now available in the US. It will be available as of July 1st next week. Um, if you're interested in it, you can reach out to our sales team and we can talk to you about it. But for now, let's just show you what it's all about. So let's take a look at this first sample. So in here, you can see I have a little part, right? Um, we can start with this open pocketing and, you know, we can even here. Let's let's just get rid of all of this stuff. We'll just start from scratch. It'll be more fun. Okay. So boost milling is available in end milling and in roughing. Okay. If I go into my end milling routine here, we'll let it go ahead and generate something for us real fast. And then we'll go ahead and mess around with some things. All right, perfect. So I'm going to turn off the auto update for a sec here and let's take a look. So I'm going to set, first of all, some kind of feeds and speeds. That looks good. How about a 10,000 chip load? Great. Now, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come into here and I'm going to come down here and activate boost milling. Now, when I activate this, I want to point out something else that's changed in the interface. Uh, notice that instead of it opening up and expanding the window, any of these sub options are now drop down options. Makes it a little easier and cleaner to work with. Uh, for those of you using volume mill, it's still available there. Here we can activate boost milling. Uh, when I activate the boost milling, a couple of things that we want to talk about. First, let's go ahead and set this to a reasonable depth. I just want to do this in one depth of cut. Let's maybe set a 20% engagement, and then let's go ahead and generate. Okay. First things first, you can see how boost milling is working. It's working its way from the outside in. It's maintaining that 20% engagement. It's varying the feed rate wherever it needs to vary. And more importantly, or not more importantly, but also, this is kind of cool. The way the software picks up between altitudes, so you can see here, and that's controlled down here, if I set that to something bigger, like 100 thousandths, for example, we'll see that that pops that up higher, just so you can see. This is that micro lift in between cuts. But the way Boost does it is it does it with helical exit and helical entries. So you're always going as smooth as possible between each cut. Now, another interesting thing about Boost milling is the fact that we can go below a 7% radial engagement. So I can go to 5% and it will calculate and it will work. Some of the systems out there have a problem going below a 7% radial engagement. Because boost milling is also written by Top Solid, it is also using everything that Top Solid uses, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with 64 bit technology, multi core processors, all that kind of fun stuff. Now, there's a couple of other things to understand about boost milling, but we're going to go ahead and look at that on the pocket inside. 
So let's let that go ahead and crunch out real quick here. And then we'll go ahead and look at the next tool path. All right. Now, if I go and do this one in here, again, same thing. I'm going to come into here and I want to go to end milling. We're going to go ahead and make a couple quick changes. First, I want to be at, you know, that one inch depth of cut again. Why not? And let's say we want to be at that 20% engagement. Sure. And let's go ahead and turn on boost milling again. Okay. First, you guys should notice how fast that's calculating. That's calculating really, 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 really fast. Let's maybe go look and grab. Eh, no, we don't need to grab a smaller tool. Let's go ahead and play with some of these settings. Okay. If we go into settings, and I'm going to set this maybe down to 10%, just so we get a little bit more. And now I'm going to go to the boost page. Now here, I'm going to set this to a little bit tighter tolerance, so it's a little bit more accurate. And then you can play with your chip thinning. Okay. So for example, if I go into here and I set this to 100% to 120, right? Or if I set this all at 120, what you're going to get is heavier cuts where it can and then it starts to use boost out to there okay this is the minimum feed rate variation okay you can even play with your radiuses here so if i want to set my radius to be a little bit smaller you can see you can nibble in there greater if i set my chip thickness to 50 percent you get more motion if i set the chip thickness to a larger chip you get less motion okay or less boost style motion. But that's the general idea of boost milling. Like I said, it's it's available in end milling and it's available in the roughing algorithm today. And we'll take a look at it in roughing um, in a second here. So let's get out of that. Let's go to this next sample and we'll have a look at boost inside of here. And for example, you can see already my tool path. Okay, if I go and edit my tool path, First of all, under kind of machining, you're just on roughing. Okay. For those volume mill users out there, you still have volume mill right there. And then if I come into here, you set boost because it's top solid option, just like you would in here. Okay. And again, the, the settings are identical. If I go into boost here, you have the same simple settings. You have your uh, smoothing radius, your lead in lead out radius. The only thing you don't see here is a tolerance because it's tied to this tolerance up here. OK, now if we go and watch a simulation of this, let's go ahead and verify and let's see what it does. We can go ahead and hit play. And let me slow this down a little bit so we can see. So you can see that's doing its little nibbling. Nice, big, smooth looping passes. It's using that helical entry exit with the micro lifts to keep everything moving as smooth as possible. We let this thing continue on. Clean it out down there. I want to get this to where it's doing the top. You can see here now, again, it's just working its way in. Always making clean, optimal motion. All right, and that's boost milling. Hope you guys enjoy this one. All right, let's move on to the next point. Again, if you guys have questions, um, please, by all means, pop them out. And uh, Joe is on the line with us. He'll do his best to answer them, or we'll, he'll bring them up to me at the end of the, the presentation, and we'll, I'll try to answer them live if I can. All right, so next uh, improvement is feed rate on last axial pass. All right, so what does that mean? So if we take a look, here I'm doing just some simple tool path on this part, right? If I go into my settings here, we go in and uh, if you notice right here, if we have a final axial depth pass, this becomes available and you can change the feed rate for that final depth of cut. For example, here I have mine set to a factor of 150%. So if we take a look, Right now, my feed rate is 200 inches a minute, right? I want to go a little bit faster. And if we go here and we go and 
post-process this. There we go. We'll let that pop up here. So again, there's that first feed rate, right? Two uh, feed of 200. And if we go down here, when we get down to the bottom, oops, I think I blew right past it. There it is. Changing to 300% or 150% of the feed. Okay. Um, you know what? Just something popped into my head here. One more uh, interesting thing that is available, and I'm going to just talk about it in Boost because, well, why not? Um, if I go back to this one, for example, another fun thing that is an improvement here, this has to do in the plunge, okay, is two new controls, okay? First of all, uh, you, of course, can change the feed rate of the plunge. So maybe you want the plunge to be at a different feed rate, you can do that. The other thing you can do, again, provided your machine allows you, is you can change the spindle RPM for the plunge move, as well as add a dwell at the end of it so that it can speed up or slow down to catch back up to itself. If I go and post this out, we'll take a quick look. And I'm going to go here and just find pocketing. All right. So here you see the spindle speed slowing down. Dwell, it's doing its thing. Now it's going back to the program spindle speed. Dwell for a second for it to catch up. And then it starts in with the rest of the cut. So that's not a boost option. It's available, I believe, in all of the end milling strategies. But uh, just another fun little improvement. OK. so. Let's move on to the next topic. Okay, so now we have something called use bounds for outline. With the use bounds for outline, it's kind of an interesting command, okay? So let me just delete this and I'll show you. If I come in here and I select this, this little face and I go to end milling, one of the, the challenges of this is it's going to do everything it can at that altitude, right? And it's really, really hard to get the software not to machine all those. And maybe you want to machine them in a specific order, or you just want to control it. Well, now you can. You can go into here. And there's a command here called use bounds for outline. You select that, and now it's only going to machine that local face. Okay? When uh, If it's a new installation of the of Top Solid 7 for you, this dialog is probably minimized like this. So you can either hit that to find it. Or my preference is just drag this out so that you see everything. It's just a little bit easier. Okay. If that's on, it's on for all geometries selected while in this operation. So again, a simple little improvement, but it gives you uh, gives you some some good control. In fact. All right. Let's keep on trucking here. All right, link off stock. This one is uh, is really, really neat also. So here I have a facing routine, okay? And I did my best just to have stuff prepared for you guys. Um, so with link off stock, uh, this is a control in the high-speed machining options of the operation in end milling. So here I'm in facing. You can see I'm using sweeping methodology, right? Um, if I go to the high-speed machining and I turn off link off stock, you can see the link rapids through now it's not causing collisions but it does cause operators to freak out okay so you can control to say you know what if we're going to do this and uh, just for those of you who are new to top solid the blue means we're going at max machine feed so we're not rapiding we're flying at a really really high feed rate so that you have good linear movements okay turn that off goes through the part turn it on goes around the part you can control with this command, what the max length is, so that you can control whether we're rapiding, max feeding, or whatever. Okay. Perfect. We'll keep on going here. I see some uh, some questions popping out there. I see that Joe's answered them, so that's good. 
All right, so let's keep going to this uh, next point, which is sweeping automatic. Okay, so in this one, one of the challenges that existed was if you had a detail like this, which again, this is a crazy sample, but it's just to illustrate what's going on. Let's go ahead and delete all of these other ones real quick, and we'll just start here. So just to review, I am sweeping on this, right? If I go to my settings, okay, I'm in sweeping mode, and for the sweeping angle mode, I'm set to automatic. Okay, I'm on minimum path number, um, just so that I get a nice clean cut across the part, right? So with it set to automatic now, it's going to determine the sweeping angle depending on the geometry selected. Before, whatever the first geometry selected was, that's how it measured the angle. So now it's measuring geometry by geometry. Okay, and that's sweeping angle. Now, there's another little improvement uh, more to sweeping uh, angles. So let's go take a look at that really quick. That's the next one here. So the other thing you have now is you have three ways to control your sweeping angle. And I suppose I could have done it in the other one, but that's okay. So we're again, we're on sweeping under end milling. If I go to my sweeping angle mode here, notice you have value, automatic, and direction. So value, type what you want. I want to sweep at five degrees. Okay. Uh, if I go to automatic, it measures for you and it does the, the hard lifting for you. Um, I think that's what most people use most of the time. And then you have direction. I want to sweep this based off of that direction right, or off of that direction, because you just wanna, maybe you need to have the cutter marks following the exact same direction as these cutter marks, because that's a requirement from your client, okay? So three little improvements there. Let's keep on going. So next one is called clearance off stock, okay? And let's take a look here at facing to begin with. So, on facing, here's what clearance off stock does, and this is in the strategy section. So let me go into the strategy section to show you where. It's this command right here. If I turn that off, toolpath is leading on, coming around, coming around, and then right here, it's just picking up and leaving. Okay? Depending on your machine, you might actually leave some cutter marks there doing that. So clearance off stock just says, feed on out. Okay? Notice I have simple geometry optimization, so it's following the simple geometry optimization. If you turn that off, you're probably going to get a nice smooth move off instead. So it just depends on what you want to do and how you want to control it. So that's on facing. Let's take a look in pocketing what happens. Okay, so in pocketing, similar. So here is the exit move. If I come down to here and I say clearance off stock, it's just a direct move off so that it's off the material and away you go. If I do the same thing on an open pocket, come look over here. This is gonna be that final movement here, I believe. And if we turn that off, okay, now it's coming off. The tool may be still in contact with the surface and pick up. This is forcing it to come off, okay? So again, Another little simple improvement, but it gives you a little bit better control of how the tool exits the material during an end milling operation. Okay, this next one, uh, first starting altitude forced, this one's pretty cool also. Um, in fact, it has to do with the plunge moves, okay? So if we look at this tool path here, you'll notice my helical move is starting at some random height up there, okay? How is that being controlled? Well, that's being controlled thanks to this new command. So if we're going to settings and we go to plunge, you'll notice an option up here called use forced Z altitude plunge. If you turn that off, the software calculates in full automatic mode, okay? It's with, uh, if you have, for example, uh, if you have Z pass stock fitting set to stock, it's going to go down to your rapid plunge clearance above the stock and off you go. Where this becomes interesting is sometimes you just need to fudge some things. So you want to control things a little bit more. So you can come into here, you can force this to be on. 
you can type it as a value. Why not? Okay, so we could say this is a value of minus 0.1, and now that's going to be minus 0.1 from my G54, so I'm starting up a little bit higher, right? You can, of course, do a point. So if I select that point right there, then you can have a shift from that point. So I'm a half inch above that point. Again, at the end of the day, the whole point here is that you have a little bit better control of the starting altitude of these plunge movements. All right, cool. Let's keep on going. All right, so search faces by uh, altitude. This one is, again, also pretty neat. So I have my part, right? I wanted to machine specific faces at a specific altitude. So here's what we're going to do. Let's get rid of all those, and let's show you how it works. So if I go into here to the plus sign, you'll see a new command here called faces by altitudes. I can select a face. I can set a tolerance and hit tab. Okay, and it's going to find every face that's within that tolerance in Z. If I set this to a bigger tolerance, notice it grabs these two as well, which are higher and lower than those faces. So it's just a way to manipulate and make selection a little bit faster. We're using this as the reference face, the reference altitude, and this is a plus or minus in Z in this case to find those faces. Click OK. You've now selected all those faces really, really quickly. All right, let's see what's next. All right, so this next one's kind of neat too. This is called swap lead in and out, okay? This is, uh, this is swapping them during a repetition of a tool path, okay? So if I, let's, uh, let's delete the repetition really quick and I'll create it again on the fly for you guys. So let's say I wanna repeat this tool path. So I'm gonna go to repeat. Uh, my repetition is gonna be symmetric. Why not? We'll say it's the YZ plane. Perfect. You'll see down here now you have swap lead in and out. And I'm just going to leave it as it is right now to show you the way the toolpath would be generated. Okay. So you notice that I have a long extension over here. Now I have a long extension over here. Maybe we want to change that. So if I go to uh, edit of the repetition, I can say swap. And now we regenerate. And now notice that extension is over here on the way out of the cut instead. Again, it's just a way to manipulate things should the need arise. All right. Let's go to overcut. All right. This one um, I'm super excited about. So side milling. We've added something wonderful in the extensions for side milling. We go to lead in and lead out. Right now I have a 20 millimeter extension and notice there is a lead in overcut type here. You have either tangent, which you can see exactly what that's doing. That is making a tangent extension. This is a spline shape. This is just an arc shape, but it's a tangent extension. Or I can say along curvature and now it's following precisely the curvature of the geometry. So depending on what you're after, this again gives you better control. And of course, this is just standard. You can control the lead and over length that you want. Now you have control over it, whether it's following curvature or tangently. All right. All right. So this next one, this is a change. Some of you have discovered along uh, the way of uh, implementing top solid 7.14 already. Um, so we made a little change to side milling. So if I go into here to this side milling, first of all, let's uh, let's take a look at something here. So if I look in here, I believe minimum radius is a quarter of an inch. Okay. So that's this corner radius here is a quarter of an inch. And I'm using a three quarter inch end mill. What's happening or what would happen is we would get a sharp angular movement here in the corner. The change in the software is this. In the compensation diameter down here, there's a new default value that adds a 50 thousandths uh, value to the max compensation diameter. If I take that value out, right, you'll see 
square corner. So we're burying the cutter, moving on, burying the cutter, and coming out. If I add that back, or you can type values, you just gotta be the diameter of the cutter plus what you want, okay? It's gonna add a small radius there, so we generate the turn. However, the other thing this does is that 50 thousandths is your maximum compensation value then. It adds a perpendicular move here to your lead-in. So this is where cutter comp is gonna be activated and deactivated, and that will be your maximum compensation there. So if you only put a, a thousandth there or two thousandths there, that'll be the max you can comp by on the machine. So you might wanna put a, a better value. This is why we set a default of 50 thousandths, okay? Off we go. All right. So helix information. Um, maybe some of you are aware of this. Maybe some of you aren't. Um, in your quick settings balloons, if you double click on the number there, it gives you information about the cut. Okay. What we've done is we've added to this the helix information. So here I'm doing helical contouring. So right now, let's go see what I have it set to. I'm set to an angle. So I set it at one degree. So this is showing you what the actual step of the helix is, okay? From there, um, if we change this to step, which is now gonna be driven by that, now it's showing you the angle of the helix instead. And the reason we wanted to add this is because we needed to uh, we wanted to make sure you knew what was going on with regards to the angle or the step of the helix. All right, perfect. Next. Empty passes. All right, so it's not what you think. So again, a little improvement here for empty passes. Um, last year in 7.13, we added the ability to have a final radial spring pass, right? In 7.14 uh, this year, you can choose whether you want it on all axial passes or just the last axial pass. So in this case, we want it to be on all axial passes. And if I go here and I run the simulation, just so you guys can see what happens, let me bring this down, we'll speed this up a little bit. So as we come around the corner here, because we have it set to all axial passes, it's not gonna pick up, it's just gonna continue with that spring pass at that altitude. And then we'll transition down to the next Z level. Okay, perfect. Now, let's move on to the next one. All right, so this one has to do with breaking uh, vertical edges. So I think last year or the year before, I don't remember, we added this awesome command to add a fillet or a chamfer on hard edges of a profile. So here, if I go into settings and I go to my angle management, okay, this is not the improvement. The improvement is you now have a specific control. So with a specific control, for example, I have it set to fill it here. If I set this to none, let me back up. This here is set to chamfer, 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 right? If I go to specific, I can set this to fill it or loop or whatever. So if I go to fill it between 89 degrees and a 91 degree angle, so an angle like this, I'm putting a fillet in, a small fillet, Whereas on every other thing, I'm just breaking the edge. Okay, and if we look, you can see it put a nice little chamfer there and it put a nice little fillet there. Uh, to show you just a different way over here, you can see I'm doing something similar, but on my 90 degree side, I'm doing a loop to keep that edge sharp. Why not? So again, just giving you more control. All right, let's keep going. All right, so this one's kind of interesting too. We've added the roll-in uh, method to side milling, okay? It's kind of neat. So if I go into settings, 
and here, let's just, uh, let me just do it from scratch. It'll be more interesting for you. So if I go here and I go to side milling, okay, there's our normal side milling. I just want to see one depth of cut. So I'm going to set a big depth of cut here. Let's go ahead and go to our settings. And we're going to go to our lead in lead out. And for our lead in, instead of tangential, I'm going to use roll in. Remember, this is a chip thinning lead in strategy. Okay. Now, I'm also going to set this to be path begin at first segment, the segment start point. Okay. That moves the lead in or the lead out to be at the end here. If we leave it like this, that's saying we want to lead in, lead out there, but because we want to roll in, it's automatically extending to here. Okay. So now you have your roll in, you have your simple lead out, off you go. All right, let's see what's next. Um, oh, so just with that breaking edges uh, topic, I should have done this before. Um, here, we'll go edit this one, why not? Uh, in 7.13 and prior, if you wanted to use the angle management over here, right, you could not use helical mode. Now you can. So you can see we're going at a constant helix here and we're still doing all the edge breaks along the way. And it's all going to be simple G, uh, genome code, of course. All right, what's next? Okay, small little improvement with slot milling. Um, basically, each time you're doing a slot milling and we're doing it on um, curves, for example, you can control the direction of cut now. So you can say, I want to be there and there. You just double click on the arrows. This way you can try to optimize your rapid movements. That's pretty good. All right, let's look at the next one. Again, another small improvement to slot milling. Uh, with this one is we have added the falling leaf plunge strategy. So if I go in and look at my slot, and here, we'll do this also from scratch. So let's go here. Let's go to slot milling. I'm going to come set a few things. First of all, I don't want to use leveling in this sample. I'm going to set my depth of cut here maybe to six millimeters. That's great. Okay. And I'm going to set my uh, type to be a square step. Okay, next, I'm going to go to my plunge method, and I'm going to turn on falling leaf. Now, magically, you see nothing. Why? Because in order for this to function, you must, must, must take into account the stock. Otherwise, it doesn't know where to start it from. Okay, so activate, take into account the stocked machine. Now we can control this. Um, we can set the distance as what we want. I can make that a nice big distance, set the slope angle to something shallow, so you're just tick-tocking back and forth, and off you go. Okay, the next one is uh, similar, uh, so we're going to use the same part here really quick. Uh, this is just showing that you can force the Z starting altitude. So I'm going to go here to force the Z starting altitude. Um, just give it a shift if you want. I want this to be five millimeters because maybe this is a forging or a casting that you're machining and the amount of material there is more than you anticipated. So this way you can just shift it a little bit and off you go. Perfect. All right, let's keep on going here. All right. So this one is kind of cool. Uh, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't, but you can modify uh, multiple parameters at once. So for example, I can select all these things, go into editing and do multi-parameter addition. So if I wanted to change my depth of cut, for example, uh, I could go search for it in here, modify them all at once, off you go. The improvement this year is to switch material side. Okay, so switch material side on a profile. If I click that and then watch your toolpath out here when I hit the green check mark, now it's all on the opposite side of the profiles that it was before. 
Again, just a quick way to make an edit. All right, we're nearing completion here for the day. Um, we're going to do a couple more. We should be done in about 10 minutes or so for those of you that uh, need to move on with your day. Um, so this next one I think is a big one. This is to automatically check for collision and modify the tool path when you're doing a corner rounding tool path. So let's delete this. Let's show how it works. If I go in here, select my radius, and I go to my radius milling, okay? It's got my tool already. If I show my tool, you can see it, okay? If I go into here and I want to change my starting altitude just for fun, I'm going to say let's go to a point. Let's go to the top there. Perfect. So if I was to let this run right now, that's going to run into things. So if I turn this on, take into account the finish, and you watch your toolpath over here, you can see everything shifted. How did it shift? How is it being controlled? Well, it's being controlled by the peripheral distance down here. If I set that to a half millimeter, for example, you can see now the diameter of my tool is going to plunge a half millimeter off that part. If I set this to five millimeters, it's going to be five millimeters off that part. And just to illustrate this, we'll go ahead and run the simulation. So here's your plunge move on. And we're nice and safe away from that wall. If we go and modify that, again, we'll go into settings. Come down to the bottom here and let's set that to 0.5. Now we're going to be a lot closer. And if we run that simulation, you can see we're very close to the part now. But it's doing what it can to help avoid collisions. All righty, what's next? Ah, so we made a, a little change to chamfer milling. Okay, I'm not going to run this one from scratch. I'll just talk about it. Uh, before, when you were describing your chamfer, you had to describe negative values, okay? We just inverted it. So now you can type a, a positive value in. I want a one millimeter chamfer, and now it automatically compensates and goes to an altitude of minus one. You can see that up here, okay? If I change my flat length to be a half millimeter chamfer, it goes to minus half five automatically. Another little improvement on chamfering, there's another file for it, but I'm just going to show it to you right here is with the machine direction, you now have the possibility to do zigzag chamfering. This way you get rid of some rapid moves, as you can just see. So we come, we machine back, off we go. So two nice little improvements for chamfering for you. Alrighty. Uh, Another uh, small improvement, this one's to breaking edges, actually. So here, we'll start this one from the beginning. So if I go here to breaking edges, hopefully you guys all use this, it's a good function. If I go to geometry and I go search and find everything, you have the ability to not only sort, but to control the tolerancing of sorting. Okay, so I can say I wanna do an X then Y zig, and my optimization tolerance is going to be whatever, okay? In some cases, in certain geometries, playing with the tolerances will change the sorting of the geometry, okay? Again, a little improvement, but a nice clean one. All right, this one is kind of interesting. So this is called uh, only use the profile outside. So we have an environment object, right? The environment object is this fixture. We're holding this part in this fixture, and right now we're machining, okay? If I come into here, and let me expand that again, there's an option here called Use Outer Outline for Environment. So it's using the outermost outline for the environment, which means that it can't machine anything there because it's all at that same altitude or below. If you turn that off, then it uses the inside and outside profile. It uses the closest profile for the environment. Again, just giving you more control and manipulation over how environments are seen by the software. Uh, yes, Hermie, there is. Uh, I'll try to show you guys live here uh, at the end. 
uh, I just was noticing Hermes' question. Uh, is there a way to eliminate the pickup on jig zigzag passes? So when it gets to the end of one pass, it leaves the stock and goes directly to the next. Uh, you set all your uh, clearances to zero, in fact, for your rapids, and it will just move straight down. Okay. Alrighty. Let's move on and see what time we have. Um, let's go to rough finishing here. We'll, cut, we'll come back to mouse facing perhaps, but uh, we're, we're running a little longer than I wanted to, so I want to just hit on a couple of other ones. So in the roughing algorithm, we added another new routine here. So to access it, you go to kind of machining. It's right here. It's called roughing finishing. So this is really popular in aerospace parts, deep thin wall parts like this. Basically what it does is it roughs at a Z altitude and then right away finishes all profiles of that Z altitude. Okay, so you have integrated contouring right here. With the integrated contouring, you have access to cutter compensation and what have you. The other thing to know about the contouring is it is simple math contouring. It's exact math contouring. What that means is we, we're not using point-to-point -point code anymore. It's all going to be G1s, G2s, G3s, anywhere possible. So if we see an arc, we cut it as an arc. Okay. If we are to watch the simulation, maybe we'll watch this and verify. Let's hit play once. That's going a little too fast. Let's slow it down. So that's the roughing. All right, and then it's doing the finishing right now, and that finishing is with cutter compensation. Uh, pro probably the easier way to see that would be to generate some code. So let's do that. Let's go find a Fanuc mill. That's great. Oops. Let's set this to G code. Let's go find uh, G41. Maybe 42. Maybe I didn't turn it on. Good demo. See, even the best make mistakes. Oh, yeah, see? It helps if you click that button. <laughs> so if you want to use compensation, you got to activate it. We'll let that crunch out. Let's generate ISO one more time here. And I'll bet you this time, if we do a search, there you go. So you can see on that last pass, G1s, G3s, G2s, we're using cutter comp, and off you go. And again, that's at every Z level, okay? All right, the last, uh, the last thing I would like to show today is uh, a new algorithm we brought forward. We had this in our version six product, and it's finally showing up here in version seven. I'm thrilled by it. It is called swept machining, not to be confused with sweeping machining. So with swept machining, it's pretty awesome. You have a guide curve and a section curve. Okay, you can access it right here. It's swept machining, or of course from the icon bars or pull down menus. I'm going to use a, a ball nose tool for it right now. I'm going to go start by selecting my geometry. The first thing we're going to select is our drive curve. So I'm going to say that's my drive curve. And then my section curve is that. And I'm, I want to machine from the top down or from the bottom up. Just depends on what you want to do. Okay. Beyond that, you have a simple computing tolerance, stock to leave. You have a scalopite or step over that you want to maintain. Okay. And off you go. Now, what's really awesome about this is that this is all simple, exact geometry calculation. <clears throat> Again, let's go generate some G code. Let's go find ourselves a nice post processor. Oops, a little fast. Again, we'll use a simple FANUC. We'll hit go. And you'll notice G2s and G3s, G1s when it's just linear, G2s, G3s, G1 when it's just linear, but it's all simple code. If we go and do the inside, so let's go ahead and do this. Swept machining. If I go to here, I go to here, 
I'm going to start from the bottom, work my way up. Something important to know about swept machining, by the way, it does not know there's a solid model there. Okay, this is a down and dirty style tool path to just get you what you need fast, but it is not checking against that 3D model. So, what does that mean? That means that if I wanted to use this ball mill to machine this, I need to make this section curve the radius of the tool taller at the endpoint here so that I don't violate this face. Right? Of course, you could use constant Z, any of the 3D algorithms to do whatever you want to do. It just depends on what you want to achieve. Okay? So, that said, um, let's see if I can go back and answer Hermes' question for him on the chamfering. So, let's go back to here. So right now, if I go to my zigzag cycle, right? So let's go to here, go to zigzag. So if you set that like so, you'll notice it barely lifts up and moves on. Um, I think you can play with your altitudes to get rid of that even more. Uh, that might be, and on chamfering, that might be as good as you get. But in side milling, you can play with your altitudes and go straight straight down. Okay? So uh, hopefully this answers your questions. Uh, does anyone at this point have any other questions on any of the new functionality for Top Solid 2020 with regards to two and a half axis milling? All right, I'm not seeing anything pop up. So at this point then, I'm gonna say thank you for attending today. I hope you guys found the webinar to be uh, informative. Uh, like all of our past webinars that we've done for this uh, series of webinars, they should be, the recording should be available on the blog, on blog.topsolid.com on Monday, probably in the afternoon sometime. Um, and then next week, Friday, be sure you guys register for the webinar then. That's going to be all the new improvements for the 3D machining. I hope everyone has a great weekend and thanks for attending today.